roll my dice and call me Vecna, have I got something exciting for you. What is the one thing I'm always saying we need more of in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition? A better Phoenix stat block. That's right, I'm talking about Fey, baby, we got a brand new Fey creature on the way in this week's episode of Monster of the Week. So welcome, my name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and this is the show where we dig up old monsters from past editions of D&D and other tabletop games and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition D&D game. <laughs> And this week's monster originates from the mythos of the Philippines and eventually made its way into Pathfinder, and now it has come into our possession. That's right, the Tikbalang is a fey creature that is guaranteed to make your players scream in terror. Not only is this half horse, half man an absolute horror show to look at, it is extremely frustrating to deal with. There aren't a ton of creatures in D&D that make use of illusion magic, and those that do exist are often notorious for being very difficult to handle, and the Tikbalang is absolutely no exception. This mysterious spirit lives in ancient forests, and if you find yourself unfortunate enough to be in its forest home, you're gonna have a bad time. So today, as always, we're gonna talk about just exactly what a Tikbalang is, why you should care, and how it does battle, and then eventually how we can actually use this creature in our games. So if you are interested in the description below, you can find a link to the stat block if you wanna follow along while we talk about the monster. But otherwise, without further delay, we're gonna talk about some... So in its most basic and pure form of aggression, the Tikbalang has access to some pretty devastating melee attacks. As you would probably assume based on the imagery you're being shown, it has two claw attacks and it has a pretty powerful bite attack. But underneath that greasy mop of hair are hidden several spines that it can also shoot out at up to four targets within one round. So don't think you're safe just because you've got some distance between you and this thing. Now as much of a menace as this thing is in close quarters combat, and trust me, it's nothing to be taken lightly, its true strength lies in the ability to cast and create a whole slew of illusions. See, when you're running a horror-themed game or session of D&D, there are several different kinds of horror. This creature appeals to the kind of horror that is a slow build. See, through a combination of spells like Seeming, Mislead, Hallucinatory Terrain, and Minor Illusion, the Tikbalang is able to create a small world in and of itself. When you pass into the territory of this creature, you are stepping forth not off the material plane, you're still in that forest, but you are in the Tikbalang's domain. And it has so much control over what you see and what you hear in that area, it's gonna lead you wherever it wants to lead you. All the while, the creature itself is able to remain invisible. So let's talk about some of those spells for a minute. Seeming is a spell that allows this creature to take on the form of another creature that at least shares similar proportions to itself. So it can't make itself look like a giant dragon or anything like that, but it can make itself look like a medium or large creature that is at least humanoid. Because of the fact its arms are like four feet long, it might look kind of gangly, but it's able to do some minor adjustments, I believe within a foot of however tall or short it wants a part of its body to be. So it could appear to your players before, during, or after this ordeal in the forest and kind of make itself appear as a friend, a foe, or just a random bypasser because its entire drive here is to protect its territory. And it will take delight in leading people down many different paths that all seem to end up leading them to the exact same location, even when that makes no logical sense. It will psychologically torture anyone fool enough to tread in its land. And as if those spells weren't bad enough, it also has a mimicry ability that allows it to replicate any sound that it's heard before. And this includes voices. So it's able to use the voice of another person that it's heard before as if it were that person. Now, of course, with successful wisdom or investigation checks, people are able to see through its illusions. And this includes its mimicry ability as well. But if that happens, you might be better off just playing along because it will resort to savage attacks if push comes to shove. But where the fun in using a creature like this actually lies is in how you use it. So let's take a moment and talk about some... Stay out of my territory. 
So as is the case with most fey creatures, the Tikbalang is weird. Its motives are a mystery, its mind completely alien, and that's kind of what makes it interesting. For the most part, it's happy and content to stick to its forest home, and that's a great place to spring a random encounter on your players. If they're just trying to get from one place to another and they have to pass through a dense forest, that might include passing through a Tikbalang's territory. It's possible they could spend two or three nights even just going through the same area, always ending up back at their own campsite. This is a great setup to show the players that something's not right. Maybe they see some shadows moving out of the corner of their eye when they're on watch, but nothing ever really materializes. Perhaps before they even get to that part of the forest, the Tikbalang is disguised as an old merchant or some humanoid-esque creature that it's seen before and it approaches the party and tells them in a very kind of cryptic and odd way not to go into that part of the woods. And what's even better is if during the night watch you can get one or two of your party members to go investigate a noise or something like that and you end up splitting the party and then one aspect of the party ends up somewhere that they didn't mean to get to while the rest of the party is still at camp. Now you have two groups of them separated, just trying to find each other, but they always end up back in the same spot, except not together. The potential for mind games here is near unlimited. And until one of your players is able to see through one of those illusions, things might get a little bit desperate. See, the Tikbalang is happy to wait them out. It's an immortal creature, so it can keep sending them in circles until they run out of food and water and eventually just die of exhaustion. And it's up to your players to solve that problem and figure out how to escape, even when they don't know what they're exactly trying to escape from. But the Tikbalang is not an evil creature in that sense of the word. It is chaotic neutral, so while it may kind of enjoy messing with people, ultimately it just wants to be left alone. So if your players start crying out into the forest and bargaining with it, if they are able to offer up something in exchange, the Tikbalang might allow them to just pass through unimpeded. I mean, a lot can be said for just using your manners. You wouldn't just walk into someone's house without asking them first, would you? Now, all that said, these creatures are pretty horrific to look at, so you could easily scrap most of that lore too and just use them as kind of your classic evil fae that are just out for blood. If you just need a bad guy from the Shadowfell, for example, or something like that, and you don't want to use something that already exists in the monster manual, you could easily swap that out for one of these guys and have them assault the party at night. Given the fact that they would have so much time to set up illusions, they could make for very dangerous ambush predators. Even something as simple as just taking the entire campsite and making it appear that everything is just a little bit to the left or right of where it actually is, so the players who are looking at the battle map are bumping into things without realizing that that box is actually over here instead of over here where it's shown on the map, things like that. And it's also worth noting that these guys do have a climb speed. So even in a forest cavern or up on the treetops, they can make a great position for themselves. But ways to kill your PCs with this thing aside, there is a really interesting bit of lore that comes to us from the original legend that this creature is based on, actually. In said legend, apparently it is actually possible to tame one of these monsters. You just need a special rope that has been blessed with the appropriate magics and created in such a way that it can be used to actually tame the beast. Taming one of these things is very hard and very time consuming, but you could have maybe another fey or some kind of bad guy in your game who has tamed one of these creatures and that creature is only serving it because it's bound to through this fey type contract. So maybe you have an encounter with a bad guy who has one or two of these things at his beck and call and then when that guy is killed, the Tikbalangs don't really have any quarrel with the party, so they just run back to the forest or the Feywilds, wherever they make their home. And their horrific visage aside, I think what makes these creatures so unsettling and creepy is the illusion magic and the way you play that up. This is very much a creature that the stat block dropped into a game. It'll be kind of a slugfest. It might be able to do some neat stuff mechanically, but... If you think outside the box, you can make an encounter with this fey absolutely memorable. And to be honest, that's how a lot of fey kind of function, but I think this monster gives you a lot of agency and room for creativity when designing an encounter. That's half the fun of running a monster that is intelligent, is that it has a personality and quirks, likes, dislikes, and one tick blank could be completely different from another. You could even have two of these things in an ancient forest that are kind of fighting over terrain, and if the party's able or willing to side with one, 
then they could destroy the other and allow passage through. Or maybe the two different tick belangs are actually just the same one and it's appearing to the party in slightly different forms to test them and see how they'll try to resolve this conflict. And if they do so without killing anybody or without resorting to violence, then maybe they'll be allowed to pass through. Like I said, the only limitation on how you use the illusions and abilities this creature has is what you can think of. So if you do want to use this monster in your game, like I said before, the stat block is in the description below in the form of a Google document that has everything you need to run this creature from top to bottom. And if you are one of my awesome patrons, you can find the stat block on the Patreon page. And if you're not a patron and you like what I do here and you want to support the channel, I mean, subscribing is a great way to do that for free. And if you've got a couple extra bucks, please check out the Patreon. I always do previews of monsters I'm working on. You can watch me build the stat blocks in real time, that kind of thing. And you get a fancy little art set up for the monsters when they're done. But ultimately, that is everything I have to say about this creature this week. So as always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video. Until then, 